right. Go ahead and get us started. Hello, everyone. So my name is Deanna DeCarvalho. I am the Regional Marketing Manager here um, at Marine Max of Charleston. I think I've pretty much communicated with each of you. Um, I get the luxury of putting on these fun classes for all of you ladies. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Marine Max for those of you who have never heard of us before or don't really know anything about Marine Max. Um, we are the largest boat dealer in the country uh, with over 60 stores nationally, um, and that's constantly growing. Um, but we're definitely more than just a boat dealer here. Um, the main lines that we carry here in Charleston are Sea Ray, Boston Whaler, and then our local favorite Scout boats. Um, but the great thing about our network is that we are able to pull inventory from any one of our 60 plus stores um, when you are in the boat searching process. Um, we also have our sales experts who's there to guide you from the beginning to the end of the entire boat buying experience for you. Um, we have a business manager who is here to help you um, along the way and answer any questions with any financing along with insurance and warranty for your boat. Um, we have our amazing delivery captain who is leading this class and I'll introduce him shortly. Um, but on the day that you get to take your boat home, he's there to guide you to know the ins and outs of your boat, uh, learn all your cool new electronics and toys. And then, of course, we have our awesome experts of a service team um, to just help you stay on the water year round and, and maintain your boat. So we really want to be there for you, not just for the boat flying process of your boat, but from the beginning and into the longevity of how long you guys keep your boats. Um, and then we also put on really great educational courses like this um, around the country. We have stuff like intro boating, uh, our women on water classes. Typically we like to do those um, obviously on the water, um, but you'll get a little bit of taste of what we typically do. Um, right now we're just gonna do the classroom portion, uh, but when we do these regularly, uh, it's an hour classroom style and then a couple hours actually out on the water on a boat. Um, you learn how to drive the boat, you learn how to dock the boat, you learn how to tie knots. Um, so you'll still get a little bit of taste of that. Uh, and hopefully when, um, you know, we can again soon, we'll be able to get back in the classroom. Um, you can always find our classes or any events that we're doing on our Facebook page and then also on our website. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Captain Graham, he's gonna take over and he's gonna lead the class. Uh, we are recording this class, so I will make sure to send it to all of you ladies um, after along with the PowerPoint. And since there's a lot of you ladies on, um, what we do typically, if you have a question, and we definitely encourage you guys asking questions, is to go ahead and type it in the message chat. I will be monitoring those, and you know, don't pause or hesitate to ask anything because if you're thinking it, I guarantee you that somebody else has thought it or have, may have the same question. Um, that's really how we learn um, from these classes. And then uh, make sure you place you pay close attention because at the end of this, we have a couple of um, prizes that we're going to be giving away. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Captain Graham. He's gonna take over and you guys enjoy. Good afternoon, ladies. How is everyone doing? I'm Captain Graham. I'm the delivery captain and uh, technician here for the service department at Marine Max. Um, we have several different locations at Marine Max all throughout the country, but this one's the best. Uh, right here in Charleston, I, I think that pretty much everyone who's tuning in today is uh, somewhat local. Is that correct, Deanna? No, that's a good question. Why don't you guys type into the chat for me and let us know where everybody is watching from today? Surprisingly, last time we had people from all over. So we definitely want to hear where you ladies are from or where you guys are joining us from today. Um, so why don't you type that into the chat so we can see where everybody and also, as Deanna said, there's no such thing as a silly question. So just let them fire them at it. Um, any different uh, ideas that you have, I want to know. Um, any any questions that I ask, please feel free to chime in. And uh, we've got somebody from Georgia, oh, yeah, Tampa, Florida, Florida yeah. okay. Apollo Beach. Um, yeah, we Baltimore. have people from Baltimore, New, New Hampshire. Hampshire. Wilmington, Dallas, wow, thank okay. you guys so much for everyone that's here today. We're not so uh, it's blowing up, this is getting bigger, uh, the word is spreading, and uh, when you offer free basics to voting, um, I think a lot of people should take advantage, that's great, we're coming from all over the country now. Um, 
So a little background about myself. Uh, I've been teaching women on water for about a year now and um, delivery boat captain here for about a year at uh, Marine Max Charleston. Uh, before that, I uh, used to run Towboat US uh, in Charleston for the last six years. Um, anytime anyone broke down, ran aground, pool, or a tow home, um, that would be no matter what, what day of the week, hour of the day. Um, <clears throat> before that, I uh, ran dinner ferry in Boston and I uh, a uh, tour Coast Guardsman, uh, boats that make second class. So I've been uh, professionally boating for the last 17 years. Um, I now work for Marine Max as a, a technician. So I not only do I operate the boats, in transporting and delivering new boats to people who buy them and show them around their new toys, I also work on them. I install uh, fishing gear, I install pumps, hoses, electrical, uh, just et cetera. And I enjoy it. Great. One of my favorite parts of my job is getting to do education classes to help women become more empowered and uh, in on the water. And it seems like they're uh, really starting to get ahead of the curve now. Um, so I'm going to pause you right there because I just yeah. got word that our audio is a little bit choppy. So I'm going to see if maybe we yeah, switch to computer to phone audio and ladies if you guys bear with us for just one moment on my I can do it. Okay. Um, we'll keep it next to you. Sorry about the technology so that's some ironing out to do. We're going to try calling in with a cell, cell phone and use that as a microphone. Okay. You need a boom stick. Duct tape it to the pole and uh, Ladies, can you guys tell me if you hear us better now through the chat? If somebody can you know, Okay, great. Okay, so everyone, if, yeah, they chime in. If I sound better this way, we'll, uh, we'll just stay on it, this method so that you can at least hear me somewhat. Good, looks Next like question. we're doing better. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I don't know, I was going over my, my background. Uh, last thing I said, I was in the Coast Guard for two tours. Uh, I, I was an EMT, a boat operator. Um, I was on the law enforcement boarding team doing drug busts and migrants. Uh, I was in Hawaii, California, New York. I got out of that, and now I'm doing the professional boating, boating world here in Charleston. I love it. Great place to work. Well, let's get started with the, uh, the basics of boating seminar. Um, uh, now, at this, at this point, we're going to pull up the first screen on our uh, PowerPoint. Um, I like to go over boat terminology first, this is the basics. You know, if you're going to start being a captain, you just start talking like one. And, um, you know, the things on boats are, are commonly different than uh, as if you're talking about a car. So if you're uh, looking at a boat, um, if you look aft, that's, you're looking back, obviously. But if you're also um, on the back part of the boat, you're on the stern. And the most forward part of a boat is called the bow. Um, I know pretty much everyone knows that, but We'll go into some other things like when you go to the left side of the boat, we know that this is now called the port side. The right side of the boat is the starboard. Um, the, uh, the amount of boat that is under the water line, that is called the draft. Um, the amount of boat that is above the water line, from the water line all the way to the top of your antenna, is called a freeboard. And, uh, you, you need to pay attention to some of these aspects of your boat, especially when you're traveling in shallow water or under bridges. Uh, this definitely comes into play when you're talking about sailboat and uh, traveling through more restricted waters, such as the ICW. Now, if anyone is not from Charleston or near the East Coast, we have a long pathway inland called the ICW. It's called the Intracoastal Waterway. This runs all the way from Florida to basically 
upstate New York. And you can take this um, intracoastal waterway, depending on what tides you're rolling through, uh, you're going to have to worry about the depth of water in some of these shallow spots and how deep your draft is on your boat. So if anyone asks you, what's your draft? Um, you know, you would be like two feet, I'm on a motorboat. Or if you're on a sailboat, you can have up to six, seven foot commonly of draft. Uh, this restricts you from traveling in certain areas of the ICW during certain times. If you're going under a bridge, you need to know your freeboard or your height, of, you know, the overall height, because uh, bridges are also uh, something that you could either call for an opening or that you could fit through depending on the tide. If you have a mast that's 30 feet high and if you look on the chart, it always tells you the height of a bridge at uh, average low tide. All right. Um, okay. Next slide. We got, obviously, if you're looking, um, say you're in the captain's chair and you're looking forward. And, but if you, if you start looking towards the port, it's called the port bow. Port beam, or a beam to port, port quarter, aft. Yeah. Starboard quarter, starboard beam, starboard bow. So if you're ever pointing something out to someone else on your boat, that's how you kind of describe the direction in which something is off of your boat. Say if you saw another vessel coming at you, or another, or maybe there was something floating in the water you wanted to investigate. Go to the next slide. Um, just a quick bit of safety. We do have uh, an occasional one or two uh, incidents a year. I do tune into the Coast Guard's uh, frequencies pretty often, and I still talk to a lot of the guys out here that work in the Coast Guard. Uh, we do have people being ejected from, from vessels pretty often, and it's mainly because uh, you need to have at least three points of contact with the boat uh, in motion. You got two feet on the ground and have one hand on the boat. Now, I always used to say keep one hand for yourself and one hand for the boat. If you're walking around while the boat is moving, and you say you got a drink in one hand, and uh, who knows, a book in the other, uh, all of a sudden the captain decides to slow down or speed up or take a turn. There you go. It's that easy to fall overboard. And say you're uh, in a busy ICW area where there's boats right behind you and all around you going fast. Uh, that spells really bad news if you fall overboard without a life jacket or anyone else paying attention. Um, so, whether, the, you know, if you're the captain or the passenger, say you're the captain, because that's what you guys are going to be after this class. You're going to be proficient mariners, hopefully. All right, well, um, if, the, uh, if there are people on your boat not paying attention, you need to call out, I'm going to come up when you're speeding up, or coming down when you're slowing down, or I'm going to take a turn. Make sure everyone's aware of what you're about to do. Look behind you. Look, make sure everyone's ready for that, because uh, you don't want to take anyone off guard and have an injury and ruin your great day of boating. Um, also, uh, a big safety issue, obviously, alcohol and boating, we all know, go together like uh, peanut butter jelly. Uh, there's nothing illegal about operating a vessel with alcohol in your hand, other than, you know, being too drunk. If you have one beer and you're driving a boat, there's nothing illegal about that. In any state, this is a federal law, it's okay, um, just don't take it, uh, don't take advantage of it. Obviously, it's the same uh, 0.08 or greater. Uh, it's going to put you at that blood alcohol content that is over the limit, just like a car. But uh, uh, the only difference is you can actually operate with alcohol in um, I have dealt with this many times in the Coast Guard. I've given people uh, voting while intoxicated citations and taken them in and delivered them to the police uh, very often. And uh, mainly while I was working in Lake Tahoe, it just seems to be a big party spot out there. But uh, anyway, uh, we won't spend too much time on that because I know you all are responsible anyway. Um, these are some pollution regulations. These two placards are supposed to be on every boat. Uh, you're not allowed to dis discharge any oil. Um, if you are going to be offshore more than three miles, um, you, can, uh, you can throw garbage overboard in certain quantities. I wouldn't recommend it anyway. Um, as long as it's, you know, stuff that's not made of plastic. Anyway, next, uh, next slide, we'll go to the first aid department here. Uh, I would recommend that every boat carry a first aid kit, you know, the normal bandages, band-aids, uh, aspirin, uh, scissors, latex gloves, you know, anything to isolate, body substance isolation, right? So if you have to get someone mouth to mouth or get blood on your hands, 
something to cover yourself from any uh, unknown uh, bloodborne pathogens, things like that. Um, fire extinguishers, these are mandated to be on every vessel that has an engine. Just an example, here's a marine grade fire extinguisher made by Kid. This is one of the most popular versions that uh, most uh, non-commercial boats will carry. Um, it has a gauge here that's uh, either empty or full. Simple as that. Every time you get on the boat, make sure that thing is in the green in full. Um, you can also turn it upside down and give it a couple taps here and there because over time, after a couple years, uh, the dry chemical does uh, cake at the bottom and won't be as effective. Just a quick tip there. Um, this is something that Coast Guard is going to check if you get boarded, so make sure you got one. And if your vessel is over 26 dB, you need two, and so on and so on. So some boats do come with install systems if you have a larger vessel um, inboard uh, you know, engine, but definitely want to have a, a, a portable fire extinguisher like that. Uh, just pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. It's as simple as that. There's really nothing to it. And you just got to make sure that this pin stays in and there's a little bit of a, basically like a zip tie to keep the pin from falling out when you're jostling around, taking weight. All right. What else do we have? Ah, safety distress signal. Um, so, I got a little bit of an example here of a flare gun. These are fun to shoot, by the way. This is an Orion flare gun. They come with little uh, shotgun looking cartridges. They shoot up about 300 to 450 feet, depending on the weather and the amount of charge. And these, um, these also have expiration dates. You want to make sure that these are good to go. If you have a handheld type of flare, those are also okay. They just need to be not expired. You load the, cart the shotgun cartridge just like that, pop it in, cock it. And fire. I am not going to fire here, but you get the idea. Don't shoot it straight out. Don't shoot it straight up if there's no wind because you don't want it falling back onto you. Shoot it somewhat of an angle, but try to maintain as much hang time as possible and take into account the wind. Okay? Um, distress signals. Uh, they're, they're only meant to be used when absolutely necessary. Um, international signs of distress, waving arms. If someone's waving their arms at you, um, there's a little bit of a law, a sea thing going on. And it, it would be nice of you to stop for anyone that is trying to get your attention. Because uh, maybe someone's cell phone went in the water. Maybe someone doesn't have a radio. Maybe someone's in trouble. It would be, uh, it would be uh, good of you to stop and try to you know, see if they need any help. An orange or red distress flag. You got flares. Orange smoke during the daytime is way more effective than a flare gun. So some kits that you buy have orange smoke. It looks like a road flare. You just pop it from the bottom. Big old plume of orange smoke. Um, if you have an aircraft looking for you, they do make uh, orange dye that makes a big plume in the water. It's non-toxic. Uh, helps uh, aircraft like the Coast Guard's um, jets and helicopters find you very easily. Uh, if you have a radio and maybe um, you're not getting a clear sound, but you can do an SOS. Uh, we all know SOS is the uh, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot. That's the same in any country. You can do that with a sound signal, like uh, your ship's horn or your, your, uh, your boat's whistle. Uh, you can do that with a spotlight or a flashlight, and you can do it on a radio with your click. Uh, gunshots. Gunshots at one minute regular intervals is actually an international distress sign. Black smoke. That is not supposed to happen on most vessels unless it is one of them old working coal barges, which you don't see very much anymore. Uh, if you see a big old plume of black smoke, you're probably looking at an engine fire and it is not supposed to be there. I'd call it in and go investigate. Don't get too close. People might need your help. At night, um, again, flares are great. Don't use hard smoke in the nighttime because that is not able to be seen. Um, so I think we all get the point. That's just the basic cover of uh, distress signals. Let's move on. Um, so 
more marine communications. We got uh, reliable on the water communications. Uh, I would recommend carrying either a handheld or a fixed mount VHF radio. And why would we need a VHF radio when everyone has cell phones? Sounds like a silly question, I know. But uh, you know, cell phones they stop working after about nine miles offshore. Uh, I've been offshore many times, and many times, most of the time alone. Uh, it's an odd feeling, and when you get out of cell phone reception, you're relying solely on one last bit of gear, and that's your radio. The Coast Guard can hear you all, probably about two to 300 miles with a regular handheld radio. They have high sight radio uh, antenna towers, and uh, you can have a conversation with them farther than your boat can take you with the amount of fuel you carry, I guarantee you. Now, uh, <clears throat> VHF radios are great because if you do have an issue on the water, you can call more than one person at a time, whereas a cell phone, you might call someone and be like, ah, you know what, I'm busy. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get five boats coming to you in the amount of time it takes to make one call. You call and say, mayday, mayday, mayday. This is the vessel uh, Teresa. I am three miles offshore of Sullivan's Island, and uh, my boat is on fire. I need help. And all of a sudden, within a couple minutes, you've got boats coming from all different directions to come help you. And uh, maybe that's somewhere where a cell phone would not have been very effective or useful at all. What does VHF stand for, Captain Graham? Ah, okay. Well, that's a great question. VHF radio is uh, it's found, it's spelled uh, VHF because it's very high frequency. Um, there are other types of radio communications like uh, HF and UHF. So. Starting from the longest range communication, HF, or like a ham radio, that's a long range. You could actually talk to someone in Russia, China, with a, a high frequency radio. It um, uses low, uh, what would you call it? The, uh, the frequency is from cross, uh, crest to trough in the wave spectrum. Um, it has a longer, more stretched out pattern and it can bounce off the atmosphere many, many times. Um, you know, that's not going to be something that you see on many uh, personal watercraft or recreational boats. VHF is the common one that everyone uses. Is there a practical or reliable brand VHF that you would recommend or a particular? I wouldn't want to be biased, but, you know, um, the, mo the most common ones that I see are made by ICOM. That's just my uh, observation. But I'm not going to tell you what to get. If you go to West Marine, they have a few different versions and types of radios there that they can give you uh, more details on. But anything that's being sold at the local uh, you know, West Marine shops are going to be pretty decent quality. But you do get what you spend. So you know, don't get the cheapest one. Because uh, you're really only going to need these things when, when it really matters, right? Um, I personally own an ICOM. It's a backup handheld radio just in case my regular radio goes down. Um, but again, just make sure it's a VHF. We're, we're talking the difference now with the other kind of radios you can buy, like say uh, Best Buy or you know things like a baby, baby monitor. Those are going to be UHF, ultra high frequency. They sound very crystal clear, but they don't, they don't reach very far. Uh, VHF is a good for about 12 miles, the line of sight. So once it goes over the, uh, the curvature of the Earth and on the horizon, you pretty much lose VHF ability. HF is only going to be you know, like a baby monitor, one room to another, or maybe a couple hundred yards. Um, those are good for if you're, say, on like a commercial vessel talking from one part of the ship to another. Uh, so VHF right there in the middle, that's the one that you want to get. And those are the ones that you're going to find West Marine. Um, when using a VHF radio, um, they've been around for many years, and you know, I, I don't foresee them going away anytime soon. Um, this is the go-to device in an emergency. Um, when you are using a, ra a radio, make sure it's on channel 16. Um, this is the International Hailing and Distress channel. Um, if you wanted to talk to someone on the radio, hail them on 16, but immediately make um, make an agreement to switch to another working frequency or channel uh, so that you can you can let the uh, any important cases come through so if you if you talk more than hey this is 
so-and-so calling so-and-so. If you start talking any more than that, the Coast Guard's going to chime in and yell at you. We need to keep this line of communication open for emergencies. Coast Guard is monitoring this 24-7, and uh, it's against FCC regulations, yada, yada, yada. So hail them on 16 and switch them to another channel. Um, pretty much anything but these other channels listed, like uh, 22 is another Coast Guard channel. Channel 9 is um, actually for, uh, I don't know why we have it on this, navigation, that's that. Okay, it's the bridges are on channel nine. So anything anything besides twenty two and nine you can talk about how good your launch was or um, what kind of great amenities are at certain um, uh, marinas around the area. Um, there's definitely a, a few channels to choose from and they all kind of have a purpose, but just make sure you're not talking too much on sixteen. That's my main point today. Um, a lot of radios nowadays come with a DSC, it's called the Digital Selective Calling. Um, this is some uh, new thing that's been kind of put uh, in operation about five, ten years ago, where there's just a single button that you could press on your radio um, when there's an emergency, and it sends out a signal of what boat, um, what boat you're on, where your uh, boat is listed as an address, uh, the name of the owner, and uh, your geographical location. This sends it to the Coast Guard. You don't even have to talk. You can just tell them, uh, hey, I'm in trouble. I have no time to talk. Hit the DSC button, and the Coast Guard knows exactly where you are and that you're in trouble, and they start dispatching you. Uh, this is something that you have to register uh, on your own. Uh, it is free, and there's a website the Coast Guard that uh, will allow this to um, register your name to your boat to that radio uh, serial number. Uh, there is a channel, I, I believe it's channel, uh, well, it's one of the lower ones, I think it's two or zero. There is a channel, it's called WX on most radios that are VHF. Uh, for NOAA weather broadcast, that's also very useful if you're going out for a few days or doing a weekend somewhere, you want to hear the local uh, broadcast. Um, whereas you might tune in to the WX weather channel uh, today and find maybe it's not a good weekend to go out because we have an impending tropical storm. You might not have known that if you didn't tune in, but uh, you know a prudent mariner such as yourselves, ladies, you're gonna um, you're gonna check out the weather and uh, what's to come in the next few days because you might go out for the day and it could turn into an overnight due to no uh, no, no fault of yours. You know you could have a mechanical failure, could get lost. Just uh, plan for the worst and hope for the best. Always have enough water, food, and uh, have a backup plan. Tell people where you're going called a float plan, um, and then really you should have no problems. Next, cold water, cold weather, water boating, water weather. Um, so the best thing that you can do here is uh, when it gets cold, obviously dress in layers, thin layers. Um, you don't want to wear uh, cotton or jean material that takes forever to dry if you get wet. Um, don't wear one big poofy uh, Gore-Tex coat you want to wear um, things that, that don't absorb a lot of water and have little pockets in between. So if you have five layers on, there's more pockets of air in between. It acts as a better insulator. If you do fall in the water, um, jean or cotton material is going to make you a lot heavier. Um, down feathers, not so good because those do not get dry um, for days once they're submerged. Um, we, uh, we do know things like uh, Wool will insulate you even when wet. Wool is great. Uh, neoprene, that's usually a go-to first um, layer one. Uh, say long johns made of neoprene. It's the same stuff that you would wear for skiing. It doesn't absorb all of your sweat. It actually wicks it away from you. Uh, you know, let's talk about if you fall into the water. Um, we don't, we don't um, want to really think about it, but it could happen. If, if you do fall off your boat and say the person operating, uh, God forbid, does not notice. You might be uh, floating around for a little while, especially if it's night. Um, if this does happen and the water will be a little chillier than the air usually, um, well, what I learned at the Coast Guard is called the health position or heat escape lessening position. Um, this is basically, um, you know, tucking your, your knees to your chest, closing your uh, underarms, Tucking your chin to your chest, 
and uh, trying to keep your head out of the water. It, it really only works when you're wearing a life jacket, um, but the main spots that you're losing your teeth are crotch, underarms, neck, definitely the top of your head, and some from your feet, which you really can't help with your feet. But uh, by crunching down into a little cannonball like that, uh, it does um, increase your chances of survival longer. Ooh, my favorite part, I love this part, not tying. I mean, we've got a couple of uh, videos you can show you because it's easier to watch these videos than the lighting. But uh, I'll do a demonstration after uh, each one of these as well. And then um, I actually told the lady um, if they have wine with them at home, um, this will be a great time to get those out and just try and practice along with us. Again, if you don't have any with you, no problem. We're going to be recording this, so you can always practice on your own later. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and – actually, you go ahead and start, and then we'll start with the video. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Well, maybe uh, you all noticed how neat and pretty my stowed line is here. I'd like to skip over to number seven already because um, I thought about maybe just making my line look real ugly at first. But I, it, there's something about having a, a line all just jumbled up like this in a compartment that really irks me. I guess I was a boat mate for too long in the Coast Guard. And uh, when you reach into a compartment and you grab a line and you need to throw it to someone real quick, oh, man. I forgot we're, we're pulling into a dock and we've got a nice million dollar yacht all around us. And I got to throw this to the, the guy at the dock before the wind blows us into another boat. And I try to throw it out. Not my line. I got to pull it back in. Oh, wait. There's a knot in there. And then crash. You didn't, you didn't prepare. You weren't ready. This, um, this is how to sew a line. And every time you undo it, it will be ready to be used right off the bat. I'm going to take my line with my left hand because I'm a righty. And I'm going to have the eye that's sliced on the inboard side of my hand towards me. I'm going to make loops the same size as that eye until I've got the whole stretch of line in nice, even loops. And I'm doing a little twist action with my right hand here as I bring it towards my left hand. Okay, so look, it's all nice, nothing overlapping. I'm going to take one of my spin it around here. If I'm going to throw the line, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to number one here. If I'm going to throw it, I want to throw one side of the, the line or the other. Um, usually if you're going to throw the line to someone at the dock, you want to keep the side of the eye slice attached to your boat. So now there's that. This is now part of the boat. And I'm going to throw the rest of this line to someone, and it's already nice and neatly coiled. And I look behind me, make sure I've got good room. I'm not going to hit anything or snag anything. And uh, you can get the entire stretch of that line in one easy fluid throw. You're welcome to watch that again later on because it is all being recorded. Uh, this is the kind of part that makes it frustrating for me because I I really love to do this in person with uh, with classes. Uh, it's a great hands-on opportunity, but this is the best we've got right now. And I promise, as soon as COVID is over, we're going to start doing this in person. We can have clinics all day long if you want. I will do it on my off day because I just love working with lines and not and line sewing, line throwing, whatever have you. But if I'm going to sew the line and use it another time, I've got my nice coil. I'm going to loop around once or twice. Then I'm going to take a, a loop like this, and I'm going to shove it through the top. We call that a bite. So now I have a bite like this, and I take the bitter end, Shove it through that bite. Now you can actually take the end of this and you can wrap it around a pole like that. You can hang all your lines neatly to dry from a pole on your boat so that you don't have to stow it away wet and get all moldy or whatnot. So, can anyone, someone's saying they can't see what's happening. Is it? I 
I mean, okay, it's going to make you bigger on the screen, so okay. I'm going to go ahead and um, start the first video. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to have to mute the phone volume. Put you on my phone. So that they can hear. Go ahead and unmute you. So I'm going to go ahead and play that again, um, and then if you want, what I'll do is I'll switch from this yeah. to focusing on you so that you can do it as well. Okay. So this is the proper way to attach your line to a cleat, whether it's on the dock or on your boat. All right. Anything more than that is unnecessary, and it takes longer to untie later, uh, that amount of line on a cleat right there will hold as much strain as that line will take to snap. So if you keep putting more and more lock hitches on a cleat, you're wasting your time. I don't want to be uh, too blunt about it, but I've seen a billion different ways for people to attach lines to cleats. And let's, let's, yeah. let's call this a dock cleat. And I'm coming from my boat. Um, my boat's over here. I'm going to go ahead and send it around. One round turn. I'm going to cross over. There's a figure eight. And I'll do one more figure eight. Now, with my right hand, I'm going to twist to make a lock hitch. So it follows that last figure eight. Does that make sense? It's all pretty... If you keep on doing these lock hitches over and over and over, there's no point. It's, it's already got enough strain that this line will snap before it, um, before it pulls off of the cleat due to all the friction that is being bound up over this lock hitch. What is the next one? We've got more knots. I am not sure. The clove hitch. Ah. Uh -huh. Okay, and I saw the video of the clove hitch. This is uh, probably the, the most used uh, knot or hitch that I ever use. Clove hitch is great for attaching a line to a pole or rail. Okay, let's watch it one more time. We're going to do one round turn around the pole, and then we're going to cross over, do one more round turn, coming up through the middle on your way up. Okay, that right there is enough to hold your entire body weight on without it slipping. It might slip an inch or two right when you put the weight on, but it will stay under as much strain as you can put to it. Now, I'll do it myself here with the help of my lovely assistant. Um, let's go ahead and say this is a, um, a line for my fender. We've got a fender here. I'll go ahead and just simulate this. Because all fenders that you have on a boat have a line coming off them like this, right? So I want to hang my fender off of the, the boat. And this is the rail of my boat on the side of the boat. So I'm going to hang this down so that the fender is at the proper level to meet between the, the contact point of my vessel and the dock in which I am mooring to. I'm going to come around the outboard side of this pole or rail. I'm going to go around once, cross over, around again, 
and then it's going to come up through the middle of that crossover. Voila. That is a figure eight. I'm sorry, a cloak hit. Um, if you want it to stay longer, if you're going to leave it overnight, I would recommend just doing one more round turn through itself. Just so if you leave it unattended for several hours, it won't work itself out. But this is basically called making fast a line. Uh, because when you get good at this, you could actually do it in under two seconds. Want to time me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to need two hands on that. Now I'm about to show you. Sometimes you forget to get your boat prepared um, when you're pulling into a dock or a marina. Sorry. Oh, no. There's no time. I need to get these fenders in between my boats, and I'm about to hit the dock. That's when you go, woof, woof, zip, and it's, it's complete. Your boat is now protected. So it is great to get that uh, cloak itch down, uh, down pat, very fast. The Molin. This is um, step two on the difficulty. This, this one takes a little bit of practice, uh, but is a very useful knot because it actually creates a temporary eye in a line. Say uh, your eye splice. Am I not on camera anymore? Okay. Well, you, in, case, in case your eye splice on your uh, mooring line breaks, you can put a bullet in and it'll do the same thing. It just won't be quite as strong as an eye splice. But we'll watch the video here, and we'll do it together. You make a little loop, grab comes out of the hole, around the back of the tree, and back into the hole. Yes, the rabbit is that part with the red wrap around it. Let's watch it one more time. Make a bite. Rabbit comes out of the hole, around the tree, back into the hole. Yeah, it looks simple enough. Let's see you try it. <laughs> Let's see you try it. I think I was talking to myself in fourth person point of view. Well, I don't think we're going to, well, we could use this, but for now, oh, you, don't do that. you you sometimes do put bowling, um, bowling on things. That's kind of like level three. But right now, we're just going to focus on making a simple bowling. This is called the bitter end. This is your standing part. So I'm going to have probably about arm's length to create a decent bowling for a mooring line, okay? I'm gonna hang this part down. I'm going to make a loop. With my right hand, I'm twisting inward to make a small loop. This is not going to be my eye, by the way. This is just a bite. My eye is going to be um, down here. So, i to turn around and have it be real simple. The rabbit comes out of the hole around the back of the tree, and back into its hole. And you're going to pull these two right here. If you don't pull the right uh, strands, it doesn't look proper. But this is a proper bullet right here. And your eye should be big enough to fit around the horns of a cleat so that you can use it as a mooring line or whatever have you. There's a, there are a lot of uses for a bullet. Just know that when you put a lot of strain in bullet, say it's been there for a week or two, good luck getting that out. Because they call it temporary, but it is very difficult uh, not to undo once there's been a lot of pressure on it. So just keep that in mind. I'll do it one more time. Because this is the more difficult one. This is my bitter end. Make my loop. Twisting inward with my right hand. So I'm ready. Here's my bitter end. The rabbit comes out of the hole, around the back of the tree, and back into its hole. And I pinch down on it. Voila. This will not untie itself. And uh, once you get that down, you've got some salty points going for you. I mean, your husband's your boyfriend. The significant others. We're going to have all the terminology down. We're going to have knots down. We're going to get uh, a video going about how to properly moor your boat and approach a dock. Uh, hopefully, the volume works on this today. Um, 
And I also do the uh, the courses with, where there is hands-on boat training once uh, once we're authorized to do that again. Uh, I'd love to see you all um, in for not just the classroom studies, but hands-on boat training. I know I will have to beg you to come in and do that because that's the fun stuff. We get to go fast. We get to learn how to actually maneuver and operate that. So for these last two, we well, we did wine stowing. Mm -hmm. um, so square no. I don't square operate. not. Hi, Bob. Square enough. Uh, we can do a square enough. Go ahead. I'm going to use some fresh line for this one. Oh, For a second, we're going to open up some new line. Square knot is used for connecting two lines of equal size and material. You, make, you need to make your mooring line longer. We've got two ends. We're going to cross over and just do like a, a bow, kind of. And then we're going to cross over and put the other end through. And I know it's hard to see. Let's see if I can get closer. All right. So right over left, left over right. And when you're done, it should look like this. Just say to yourself, right over left, left over right. And you can kind of push in and out. That's kind of the telltale sign that you've done it correctly. Um, commonly what happens if you do it wrong is you get what's called a granny knot and I'll show you what that looks like because well, it tends to be how sometimes people do it when it's incorrect and it will not hold. This is a granny knot. Don't be fooled by it. It looks almost the same but it will not hold and the, the line will part itself with enough pressure and strain. So right over left, left over right. All right, what's next? We have one more, I think. Nope. The round turn, oh, we can skip it. Okay, um, there are things called the rules of the road. There's a huge book of nav rules given to us by the Coast Guard. We're not expected to remember all of them. If you're not a commercial voter, don't worry. Uh, just keep in mind some of the more basic things. Um, if you are in a situation where you are on a collision course with another vessel, if everyone turns right, no one will ever get in an accident. Uh, when you're talking about two vessels and you don't know which way they're going, the default thing to do is Everyone turns right. If it looks like they're turning left, and that means you can't turn right, then just slow your boat down until you're sure of what they're up to. But uh, that's just lesson number one. Everyone turns right to avoid collision. Um, if you're approaching two, two boats approaching or in a meeting situation, um, you can sound one short blast. That means you're altering course to starboard. Uh, if you you get two short blasts. Boop, boop. Altering course, of course. All right. Uh, overtaking is when you're passing someone. Say you've got a boat in front of you, and you're going to go around them one side or the other. Uh, you can give one short to go around uh, and pass them on their starboard, or two shorts go around and pass them on their port. Uh, notice on the left side of the boat, or the port side, it's red. That's the same color as the nav light when it's uh, at nighttime. Green is for starboard. Every boat, um, every boat is required to have these colors on their vessel so that you can tell what aspect of the boat you're looking at at night. Um, now, keep this in mind. If you are unsure of who gets the right of way, 
because um, maybe you're not, you don't know who gets the right of way. Just know um, if you're both motor vessels, whoever uh, is showing their port light gets the right of way. Basically, if you see someone's red light with their port light, that's basically like a stop sign. Let the person go ahead of you, and then you go around and behind them. See how that works? A is looking at B and seeing the red light. B can see A, and B is looking at their green light. So B is like, well, I, I get the right way. And A says, well, I see the stop light. I'm going to wait for them to go forward, and I'll go around. That's the proper way to handle that situation. Um, they, they do get a lot more in depth, but I want you to remember just basically those two lessons right there. Uh, our next slide here, uh, we have a bunch of different things that you see on the water, like uh, buoys, day boards, danger markers, uh, preferred channel markers, um, basically to make all this simple and make sense. Uh, the green markers are odd, and the red are always even. If you have to describe where you are to the Coast Guard, you can tell them uh, I'm next to green marker number one or uh, red marker number two. But uh, the most important thing to remember about these markers is if you're coming from sea inland, you keep red on the, re on the right when you return. So then just say that to yourself once or twice. Red, right, return. Uh, you've probably heard that before. Um, that's when you're entering from a larger body of water into a smaller, more inland area. Uh, now, Here's where it gets confusing. If you're from the East Coast and you know about the ICW, that does not apply because there's, they call that the ditch. That you're not entering or exiting from the ocean uh, when you're going down the ditch. Uh, on the ICW, it is red on your right when you're heading south. Red, right, south. Um, all right, running aground. This is a common issue here in Charleston. We have a lot of shoals. A lot of mud banks, oyster beds, um, usually soft bottom places just to get hung up on. On top of a uh, six to eight foot tidal uh, zone, tidal uh, difference, uh, you can really uh, get, get stuck in a lot of spots if you don't know the area. Um, first thing that you really should do when you run aground, depending on the, the speed in which you hit, you want to sit and turn around, make sure everyone on your boat is okay. Make sure everyone's still there. No injuries. Great. Maybe now check, check down into your villages, and uh, you want to make sure that there's no uh, water coming in. You have a sprung a leak that started taking on water in places that shouldn't be collecting water actively driven. Um, I would recommend studying your chart. We do have uh, a net nautical chart here. And they also have uh, electronic charts on your boat, like gardens and radarines. Uh, Keep in mind, the numbers that they'll show on these charts are at average low tide. It doesn't mean that that's the, the amount of water that's below you at that time. Um, I'd recommend having a depth sounder or transducer on your boat, especially if you're unsure of the area. Um, if you do run a boat, yeah? Where do you recommend, um, you know, checking low tide or high tides, or how do we find that out? Um, probably the best, most effective way to do that is um, using a tide app on your cell phone, or you can go on the internet and look at NOAA. It's got the tides for your area. Um, keep in mind that tides change depending on your geographical location. Uh, they happen before, like a tide will be earlier from the north to the south, and um, the farther you get from the ocean, the later the tide will be as well. So let's say the tide. Can you zoom in on that video a little bit here? Pull the chart a little closer. All right. Now, here is the local area chart of Charleston, and uh, we are located up here on Daniel Island, right around this area here near the Don Holt Bridge. All right. Here is the entrance of Charleston Harbor from the ocean. All right. Now, if you have a high tide, you're going to get a high tide first over here. And the tide won't be high up where we are for another probably 50 minutes. Now, this is a difference of, well, I'd say about 20 miles. 
So it takes that long for the tide to travel uh, a certain distance. Um, now, Charleston is a large area, um, especially with it, all of its inland waterways. So certain spots are actually up to two hours behind the high tide right at the ocean's inlet. So if you're way up in the Cooper River, you won't know it's high tide until two hours after Fort Sumter, right here at the very beginning of the ocean. Um, yeah, so I would say get a, a phone app on your cell phone, and it allows you to choose what your location is, because there's tidal zone stations all over the place. And it'll tell you to the minute when high tide or low tide or slack tide is. Um, Zero. It does range from about six to eight feet. So traveling at low tide, definitely want to keep it slower, especially if you're not, um, if you're new to the area. And if you do run aground, don't try to power through what you hit. Raise your engine up a little bit and back yourself off until you're in deeper water and try a different angle slowly. Okay. Uh, tides and currents. We are now, um, we know what highs and lows are, but what, what causes this? This is, uh, um, this, what causes tides are basically heavenly bodies like the moon and the sun. Even a little bit of Jupiter, but we're, we're not going to get too much into that. Uh, lunar effects. So when you see a high, um, a spring tide. Um, this is also called a king tide. Like once a month, there will be a high, high tide, higher than any other tide of that month. And that's normally when you see the whole moon. Uh, a neap tide will be the, the lowest of low tide. And that's usually when the, the moon is as far from being uh, full as, as it can be. Uh, diurnal and semi diurnal. Well, right here in Charleston, we have a semi diurnal tide, which means we go through two highs and two lows every single day. And the difference is about 14 minutes off. So every day, the tide gets 14 minutes later than the day before. Uh, some places down near the Caribbean, they have a diurnal tide, which is only one high and one low every day. That's very interesting stuff. I wish I had more time to talk about. Do you have a favorite tide app that you I, I use? I do. Yes, I do, and I will be. Um, uh, I'll I'll recommend Tide Track T I B E T R A C. Really, really easy to use. Um, it it's laid out beautifully. You can choose where you are, um, anywhere in the country, and it'll tell you very, very accurate times of the tides and what to expect. You can look a week in advance if you know you're getting underway next weekend. You can tell. Well, I have a one of the shallow shallow water boat ramps, and I can't launch at low tide uh, next weekend, so you'll have to look at do your research. This thing will tell you for months in advance what, what tides you need. So T-I-D-E-T-R-A-C. Check it out. Are we going to watch this video now? So this is the next slide, how to dock a power boat, but if you want to... Um, so it's a little difficult to explain the best ways to dock a power boat. Uh, taking into account the wind, and here in Charleston, uh, a big one is current. Uh, I personally like to keep my bow into the current for the predominant factor. Say there's no current, but you have a heavy wind, um, keeping your bow into that, that predominant current or wind is going to uh, allow you to maintain your coast. Uh, really, if you have a single engine boat, you need you need a little bit more speed to make your boat do what you need to do. Uh, if you have a dual engine boat, you can actually just use your throttles and twist. There's really nothing to it. But yeah, single engine vessel, uh, you need to coast in. And when you're close to the dock, you're coming in like a landing pattern with a plane. Say you're coming in at a perfect glide slope, and we're just kind of kind of flip it like this. If you're coming in at a perfect glide slope. Once you get close, you need to actually turn your, your wheel towards the dock and then put it in clutch of a stern or just barely in reverse. That kicks your stern towards the dock and you can land flush with something. I know it's anti counterintuitive to think, why would I turn into the dock if I want to land flush? Well, that's because you're putting it in reverse and it actually does the opposite, which is a, 
better better left taught in person. But if I can maybe show this video, maybe he'll show a little bit of what I'm talking about. I need to. But Hey folks, let's face it, docking a small powerboat side too, that can be a little stressful. Here are a few key tips to remember. First off, have all your bow and stern lines and your fenders ready before you begin to dock. Second, never approach the dock faster than you're actually willing to hit it. And finally, never apply power until after you turn the wheel. That way you won't accidentally push the boat in the wrong direction. Now here's a final tip for you. When you're coming into the dock, don't be afraid to ask for help. Hey Carol, would you mind grabbing the lines? See, it's a piece of cake. Did everyone um, see the video clearly and hear the volume? Maybe if I hear like one or two people answer up so we can walk them through what we just saw, I want to make sure that that came through clearly. Yeah. Great. All right. Okay. Well, as, as you can see, uh, he came in at a nice glide slope, nice and slow. If he did lose engine power, uh, which happens when you turn a boat from forward to reverse sometimes, especially the older vessels. Someone said, um, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> you know, with a lot of practice, it, it does become very, very easy. Uh, it becomes second nature. Um, and that was in a perfect day. No, no wind, no current. So um, just, you know, repetition. But as you could tell, he came close to the dock, put it in neutral, turned towards the dock, and then gently put it in reverse for a second that kicks his stern flush with the dock. If you try to turn away from the dock, you're going to hit unevenly and maybe bust a corner out of your boat or put a ding in your bow. You don't want that. So yeah, nice and easy. And just practice, practice, practice. This is something that really, that's as much as you can teach someone. Um, at this point, you know as much as I do, I've just done it more. So um, anyone can be an expert at this. It just takes practice. And I know it can be frustrating if you're using a boat that someone's not so very, you know, adamant about you using. So <laughs> um, I just recommend trying it and, uh, you know, make sure it's not too windy of a day when you're, uh, when you're not at it. Uh, well, I guess one last little section here in, in the presentation is our waterways. Um, well, it's not everyone here is from Charles. Just to go back, just to go back what you were saying about practicing, you know, in encourage them to every time when they're ready to dock to say that you want to try and, and practice docking, right? Like oh, don't yeah. be afraid to step up and say, okay, I want to, I want to practice this at this point, you know, it's the end of the day, you're done boating. Make sure that, you know, get that practice time in to, to practice docking the boat. So don't be shy when it comes to that time to, to say that you want to learn. That's right. You know, always make sure that your fenders and lines are ready. Uh, you, you, you want to be prepared. You might want someone else to wait for you on the dock to help catch the lines if you're you know, coming in at kind of a shallow slope and you're not going to make contact with the dock. Uh, but yeah, on a good day, just do it 20 times over and over. And by the time you're done, you're, you're going to be an expert. Um, so some of our waterways here in Charleston, uh, I, I would go over, for some of y'all that do live here, um, I showed you where our Marine Max location was on Daniel Island. Uh, we are just off of the Cooper River. Are we, uh, are they looking so at that they chart? So they are looking, I mean, oh. they, I can kind of point out here as you point oh. along there as okay. well. So, and I'll just follow you. Yeah, um, down here is the entrance to the ocean. And you've got some Barrier Island, uh, Morris Island, and Sullivan's Island. And you come up through Rebellion Reach, now you're in Charleston Harbor. This is the famous Charleston Harbor where the Revolutionary War was started. Uh, you should come a little bit closer so that they might be able to see that. Oh, are they looking at the 
Well, the chart. I can't uh, see the chart, chart. here, so. Okay. Well, we Let's try that. Got to hang the camera down and see. We try what we can. I'll back up a little bit. So yeah, very a lot of history here throughout the art. And it's very scenic, beautiful. Uh, this is the famous downtown peninsula area. And while Captain Graham is talking about um, Charleston waterways, we want to hear a little bit from you ladies. Tell us about your favorite spots that you love in Charleston or, you know, since we have people from all over, where you guys like taking your boats? Because, you know, that's how we learn new places to go to when we're on the water. Absolutely. A um, lot of great places to hang out here. This, there's a historic Shem Creek with all the bars and restaurants that everyone likes to hang out. A lot of good fishing off of Crab Bank, Bird Sanctuary, uh, Morris Island or Coming Point. Huge sandbar that people hang out on um, on the weekend. Uh, Charleston downtown, a lot of history down here. Uh, we've got a lot of waterways, such as the ITW that runs through here and down along the coast. Uh, this goes again from Florida to uh, all the way to New York, and you don't even have to go into the ocean. Um, if you go up the Cooper River here, the uh, Ravenel Bridge divides the Cooper and the Wando River. But the Cooper goes all the way up to um, the locks that then take you into Fort Mul or, uh, Lake Moultrie and Lake Marion, the Santee Cooper uh, watershed area. Um, you could actually, in theory, go all the way to um, beyond Columbia by taking the Cooper River if you could carry enough fuel on a small enough boat. Uh, if you go around the peninsula through the harbor, you go up to the scenic Ashley River that takes you by all of the uh, old plantation homes that you've seen on TV. And uh, the Wapu Cut Creek here. Um, so lots of great places to go boating in Charleston. I'd love to take you around uh, next time y'all are in town and we're doing a hands-on seminar. Um, and I would really encourage any questions that pop up. I wish I had more time to talk because honestly, Deanna's over here like, <laughs> Oh, He's a talker. I, I am a talker. Excuse me, but um, I will be back when? Next month? I think, uh, you know, every month, every month and a half, we do these seminars. Um, lately, in the last uh, three or four episodes, it's been through Zoom. And personally, I am an in-person kind of guy, so uh, we shall get back on the normal track as soon as we can. But we'll keep coming at you via Zoom, and I'll try to make a, a new lesson plan next time and keep it fresh. Ladies, do we have any questions um, while we have Captain Brand here? Now is your time, um, you know, to ask questions if you have them. If you don't happen to have any right now, but you, you think of it later, you know, send me an email, and we'll make sure to, to get you your question answered. Um, but right now, we'll just open it up to questions for anyone. We've got someone from St. Pete, Tampa area. Man, that place is beautiful. I, I want to take a boat out there. I've got a friend there. Uh, I think I'm going to be visiting in about three weeks on the weekend. So we're going to cruise on his boat. Um, awesome, awesome spot to boat in there. And Captain, Thank you have, guys for tuning in, though. Yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah. We do have, um, for all you avid fisher women out there, we have a couple prizes. So I have... Three of these, along with these really nifty, um, cool women on water, like water bottles. And they're really great when you're out in the water and they have this nice little sweat towel for you. So, um, Captain Graham has a couple questions. Oh, and a quiz. I, you didn't think you're getting off that easy. Not a quiz, just a little <laughs> bit of, um, you know, some prizes to give out. So, I just did a virtual. Um, Zoom trivia with some friends earlier last week, and I learned that the easiest way for us, and probably the fairest way um, for us to do the questions um, for people to answer is the first person to type it into the chat box. So if you know the answer, um, type it in, and the first person that comes up will say that they are the winner. Um, so Captain Graham has three questions he's going to ask. I'm going to monitor the chat here. You might have noticed um, me stopping my foot on the occasion. So that's when the questions will come. Do we yeah. have them written down or? Okay. Oh, 
Okay. I do. I've written them down. I could ask a lot of questions, but I want to I want to stay on topic here. Okay, first question. Be ready on your keys. What is the amount of boat under the water line called? That's right. We got draft, 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 draft. Oh, wait, was it Regina? On that one. Yes, she is. No, wait, wait. There was someone before her. Oh, I'm so sorry. Karen. Karen Sanchez. That is quick. Have the fastest fingers here. So Karen, congratulations. <laughs> nice job. I will um, get with you and how that we can get you your prize later. And okay. we'll go ahead and go on to the next question. Man, that was, that was quick. I'm impressed. Okay. We've got three types of radio communications, HF, v, VHF, and UHF. What do they all three stand for? HF, VHF, and what was the third one? UHF. That's a hard one to check that. I know. <laughs> Very high frequency. Okay. We've got ultra. There you go. That, that's the one. Karen had all three in one answer. It was very high frequency, ultra high frequency, and high frequency. The three types of communication. So since Karen already won the first one, mm. we're going to go ahead and give this one to. There was one right after her. Then. Danielle, ah. who also answered all three, and she was. Um, the next one after Karen. So it's only fair. Yeah. All right. Good job, Danielle. Danielle, if you don't mind typing in your last name for me so that I can make sure I, I have I don't know how many Danielle's we have on here. Okay. And we'll go on to the next question. Now the last question, not too hard. And it was most recently. Uh, what is the best pitch to secure your fender to a line? Or to secure your fender line to a pole or rail. What type of pitch? Oh, Megan Matthews said close. That is correct. The bowling is not. That is for doing a uh, temporary eye in a line, such as a mooring line, but close. Yes, the close, the close hitch, making fast the line to a pole or rail, usually for fenders. Man. We've got some smart students here. Awesome. I think yeah. I'm going to have to step up to some more intermediate. Uh, they were listening. Uh, we had a lot of people answer it, so that's awesome. Well, again, ladies, thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, and we hope that you guys enjoyed the class as well. Um, as Captain Graham said, we'll, you know, we try to do these every four to six weeks. Um, go like our Facebook page, Mary Mac Charleston Facebook page, um, and follow us on Instagram. We post all of our classes and events that's coming up on there. And, um, you know, this is a free class that we put on to educate all um, the ladies. Be sure to tell your family and friends about it. If you guys know anybody else that's, you know, just getting into boating or just needs a refresher for it, um, please let them know that we put these classes on. I will be emailing all of you this recorded class along with the PowerPoint. Um, it has my contact information on there. We'll have Captain Graham's ta um, contact information on there. Again, if you guys have any questions after this, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And thank you all again so much. Thank you all. Y'all have a great day.